All right, so our next speaker is uh, Dinesh LaRose. Um, Dinesh was born and raised in Hearst, and she is, well, now we have Sustainable Development Coordinator, but I think she has a new title. I, think, I, I don't know if I have it right, you can correct me. I think it's Economic Development Coordinator? Or, I, I, but it's ec oh, economic now, right? Economic Development Officer. Okay, she just has a new new position with the Hearst Economic Development Corporation. Um, she recently helped to develop and author the Municipal Sustainable Development Plan, during which she worked with industry, business, and community partners to develop an eco-industrial strategy, a community-based forest tenure model, and developed initiatives around local uh, food production, youth, and conducted work as an ab as Aboriginal liaison. Dinesh uh, received her Master's of Science in Forestry at Lakehead fairly recently, I think about two years ago. And uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Dinesh about a little bit in recent years about the, the community forestry initiatives going on in her area and elsewhere. So um, welcome, Dinesh. <laughs> It's a small crowd, but I'm still super happy to be here. Uh, and uh, like uh, someone mentioned, I'll just make it more intimate. <laughs> when I was first asked to come and speak about uh, community resiliency in the context of green economies, uh, I started thinking about what led our community to start asking these types of questions, and uh, what was the process. And what I came up with, even though uh, when it first started, when, when uh, the crisis with the forestry industry started in 2000, and, and probably realization that it wasn't really cyclical in 2003. I was, I was in Ottawa, and then I was in, in Thunder Bay, and I wasn't necessarily always present in the community. Um, but I did go back a lot, and what I did is I, I reviewed all the documents, uh, all of the meetings that took place, and, and talked to a lot of the community members through the work that I did in the recent two years. And uh, what I figure the question was uh, that people were asking themselves is, how do northern communities and forestry-based economies evolve in response to the challenges faced by the forestry industry since 2000 and most recently the global financial crisis? So how do we do it? That's a big question because it's not, there are no easy answers. And the way that was, oh, I thought I translated it, but turns out that I guess I was reading French and I thought I was reading English. Um, I'll just translate it for you. <laughs> but uh, by the way, I'm French. <laughs> Um, and, and this is more or less the timeline that I came up with. Uh, in 2003, uh, as, as far, the, I think it was really the first time that the community realized this isn't cyclical. It's, it's not, you know, the industry is not bouncing back. And, uh, and so in 2005, uh, Chamber of Commerce and, and Economic Development and some municipal uh, leaders and community members got together and said, we kind of have to do something about here, uh, about this. And uh, the expression in, in French is, il faut se prendre en main. Uh, which I guess in English kind of roughly translates to uh, we have to take our own faith into our own hands. And uh, the way that they envisioned that shift or taking responsibility for our own future, uh, it was the bioeconomy. It was you looking at our forests because we are a forest-based economy and saying, what are those underutilized resources in our forest that we haven't used, that we're not, uh, we're not adding value to? And uh, so they started having that conversation. And in 2006, they organized a conference in Northern Ontario. It was actually extremely well attended. And it was Bioeconomie, Environnement, Société. And uh, it was also in English. <laughs> and it's basically uh, Bioeconomy, bio the Environment, and Society. And David Suzuki was uh, the guest speaker. And I think uh, what the, the kind of conference did for people was kind of gave them a jolt. It started uh, really exposing uh, the effects of climate change to community members and making them think about things uh, about responsibility as citizens, as global citizens, what's happening on the global scale, what's happening on the local scale, and, and how do we take responsibility for those sorts of things. And uh, in 2007, the Economic Development Corporation decided uh, we're going to spend our energy on attracting the types of businesses that associate with our core values. And that was value added, and that was the bioeconomy, and that was looking at things uh, that may not be in the traditional sector of forestry, but that was still closely linked to the strongest resource we have in our community. And in uh, 2008, they had uh, another uh, another forum. It was called uh, Pour l'avenir de nos enfants, and that was for the future of our children. And it was uh, strategies in 
uh, economic, and sustainable development, community engagement, and the North. And so it, 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 it's tried to address what are those solutions and what are the things that we can do uh, as communities in Northern Ontario uh, to try to address those big questions and can we start thinking about the future. And I really like that little button that they're giving out that says, you know, a vote for the economy is a vote for me, but a vote for the environment is a vote for my, myself, but also my grandchildren. And that's really the question that people are asking, not just about the environment, but about economy and about society. And what are the types of things, what's the legacy that we're going to leave behind in our community? And are our kids going to be able to live here? And that's a big question. And so that's when the idea about, oh, when we need a plan. <laughs> After all this process, people are like, okay, we need to plan this out, we need a strategy, we need to actually turn it into something that we can implement. And uh, in 2009 is when, when I came in, and I was hired to uh, look at community-based forest management, and I was also handed the sustainable development plan, which the first rounds of consultation had already started. And, uh, and now today, in 2011, uh, we're getting ready to implement the plan, and we're actually at that point where we're figuring out, okay, so now we have this, these awesome strategies. <laughs> We've done community consultation for the past five to six years. How do we implement it? And, and I know that five to six years might sound like a lot, and it is, but it's a process, and it's kind of a journey, and, and I'm going to kind of describe uh, that journey not to be too corny. <laughs> so after consultations, we tried to figure out, well, based on what everyone told us and what everyone's talking about, what's our vision for our community? And while the vision is a healthy community, even if you're talking about economic development, what we're trying to achieve is a, is a healthy place, uh, a place where people are healthy and are happy, and uh, a healthy community that's committed, that's sustainable, that's self-reliant, and that's rooted in the bioeconomy. And we identified 10 major um, directions within four pillars, which are economy, environment, quality of life, and engagement, community engagement, and uh, within which it's a very, very thick document. I'm not going to go over every single recommendation, but under every um, big one, like diversification and proactive management of the economy focused on local innovation and better utilization of control of resources. There are very specific recommendations and uh, action plans that, are, uh, that were designed for our economy and for localizing innovation, localizing business development, and especially uh, trying to put the political pressures uh, so that community members can have a greater control over resources. And one of the approaches is uh, the whole principles around common pool resources. And I don't know if you're aware of, um, El I think her name's Eleanor Orstrom. Uh, she's an international um, uh, economist, and she's won uh, the Nobel Prize. And one of the things that the research she's done is basically uh, not to say defunking this whole tragedy, tragedy of the commons, this concept that you can't have common pool resources because everything is going to just implode on itself. It's the idea that communities and, and, and that there are collective management models that are extremely efficient and, and actually far more efficient in ensuring sustainability and economic development and community development. So. And for economic development, what does that mean for us? What's our job in helping the community get a healthy community and get to that point where they are healthy and, and they are thriving? And for us, the way that we've interpreted it is that if, oh, it's French again. <laughs> if if uh, we're looking for, in inside the planet, Santé communautaire et environnementale just means a healthy community and environment. If that's, our, if that's our goal, how are we going to reach it? And one of the things that we've said, okay, well, we're going to reach it through um, specific strategies that relate to energy, that relate to the forest, that relate to food, and that relate to water. So these are our foundations for the work that we're trying to accomplish in economic development. How are we going to do it? Well, we're looking for autonomy. We're looking for greater autonomy in self-reliance and energy, in food, in, in management of our forest, and in water. Uh, we are looking to do research and development to increase capacity in the local community and in the region and to increase innovation. So what's that potential? Let's realize that innovative potential we have in our community and let's ensure that there is efficient, effective, and accessible knowledge transfer. Um, I, having spent a lot of time, not maybe as much as both the other panelists, because I'm only at, I only got to the master's level, and I will be going to PhD eventually. But one of the, my pet peeves with academic research is that often there is not enough work that's done to translate the 
the research and the results in a way and in a manner that is efficient and that can actually be utilized at a local level, in a way that it actually means something in, in its application. I mean, we, we, we provide publications, we publish in academic journals. How many of you in the crowd are, receive ac academic journals? On, on a monthly basis. How many of you have read academic journals <laughs> other than Julie and Lynn and those who are <laughs> actually in university? And that's the point. It's one of the things that we want to do is, is try to take all that brilliant work that's being done. I mean, it is brilliant. There are so many amazing researchers in all of our academic institutions across Canada that do amazing work. But let's take it and try to see how we can apply it in a way that it actually works out for business and community development. And the other is, through um, um, integrated eco-industrial strategy. And that strategy is, is, is this thing. <laughs> and what it actually means, basically, it was just, what we did is we identified all the businesses, all the resources, human resources and natural resources, and waste streams that we have in our community. Um, so from our agricultural production, Agriva, which is uh, agriculture and value added, it's, it's a kind of a food value added cooperative where we work with businesses to, to develop that potential. Uh, La Maison Verte, Le Coulomber, Tamba Columbia, these are all some of the big companies in our community. And we did a strategy where we identified all of their waste streams, we identified all of their energy needs, um, and we identified all of the product needs and the product wants and the underutilized products. And this is, uh, in, in an almost 100 page document, this is as much as we can condense it <laughs> into one slide. So I know it might look a little bit uh, confusing, but it makes a heck of a lot of sense once you've read the document and you've gone through that process with the community. And that's one of the things that's really, really important is um, stats, understanding what you have physically. And it's probably one of the biggest challenges for communities in the North because turns out there isn't a lot of data and there isn't a lot of accessibility to data because a lot of it is privately owned. And that's one of the challenges we've had is in understanding and getting clear numbers on what natural gas consumption is in our area was very, very complicated and we still haven't gotten all the numbers. Uh, even electricity consumption, uh, waste streams or, or how much a company is con consuming or not taking and how much in terms of cubic meters and what exactly in those cubic meters is being used, used at what percentage. Rate at, those are things that are not always as easily accessible and those are the types of information that you need if you want to have a strong foundation of information and you want to develop an econ a new economy or something uh, that actually is going to be relevant for defining new businesses and opportunities for your community. And so if you're going to be going through that whole process, and I'll go through that really quickly because I know I wasn't called, I wasn't called here to talk about forest tenure. But the whole process that we've gone through in our community in developing a community-based forest model, which hasn't been implemented because we don't have the jurisdictional authority to do so, because we're regulated by the province and the CFSA, and there's a whole tenure modernization process going on, and none of which really jive with what the community came up with, unfortunately. Um, but it was a really useful process because it was the first time, I think, that the community actually sat down with local First Nation and said, uh, and for not for the purpose of, of a business arrangement and not for the purpose of, of this big crisis, we actually just shoved our chief and council together and our mayor and councillors together and said, talk it out, <laughs> have a conversation. What, what matters to you on, on, a, on a personal basis? And, and the tenure initiative was really good because it's one of those places where we have a common land base. We have something in common that links us together. Uh, not only just the land, but our desire to live here and be of the land and live of the land. And when you're thinking about this, this kind of um, such an important part of your life that you can all share, it's such an important thing to do. If you don't have that one common thread uh, that you can bring partners together, it's going to be extremely difficult to bring uh, you know, industry with your local First Nation, with your municipality, with, with your school boards, with everybody else. Um, if you don't have that capacity to show them or to talk about that thing that brings you together. And for us, it's the land, it's the land base, it's the forest, because it's so foundational to who we are, and not just culturally, but also economically and community-wise. So it, it, you need to find that, and, and I know you talked about it a little bit, is, is how you bridge people together, how you bond, you create that bond, and how you make those links. For us, it's the land. And that land is situated in Treaty 9, and uh, unit Forest Management Unit 601, Eco District 2E1, and however other <laughs> definitions are going to be provided by MNR. But 
that was one of the things when we created our strategy for economic development, when we created, um, and it's kind of, it's very interlinked with our sustainable development plan, is, is how you define your existence and, and who are you and, and what matters to you. And okay, so this is who you are and this is what matters to you, then how do you build a strategic plan around the management of, of that existence and, and those ambitions that you have? And that's, that's what that reflection on the land base was about. And so I was looking at community and business use, of course, the business use is huge because people want jobs. Um, but it's also about family and cultural connections to the land. It's also about Aboriginal traditional territory, ecological boundaries, and because it is a forestry-based economy, it's about wood supply. And then I, I use this slide because even though this was specifically to tenure, um, it really speaks to all of those different things. And when, when we were talking yesterday about the Green uh, Energy Act, when we were talking about the Far North Act or Endangered Species Act or any other types of acts that are being brought forward in the province, and always with the best intentions in mind, um, we have to consider community, what communities are saying about, about their place, about their land base, and about their community. And for us, it's about flexibility, integrity, and transparency in the process. And it's about getting to a place where we actually have procedural equality and communities actually get a say. They're not just imposed something and said work with it or even don't work with it because really it's not your authority and it's not your place. Uh, and so it's having that conversation about the different types of policy frameworks that it can actually enable communities um, to take responsibility for their own futures. And if they don't have any type of input and, and meaningful input, not just consultation-based input, on the, the, the resource, whether natural resource, whether it's mining or forestry or water, whatever it might be, they have absolutely no authority on it. How are they supposed to plan for the future? You know, and, and for our community, um, we're not a destination place. So as much as we might want to bring tourism in and become a fine dining mecca of Northern Ontario, it most likely will not happen. Um, we have about a 5,000 to 6,000 community, and, and forestry um, is what we do. And even though we, we want to diversify, we want to see our economy flourish in, in so many different ways. And, and heck, if we could have fine dining in Hearst, I would be so happy because I am a huge foodie. Um, but <laughs> let's also respect the fact that we do have a history and we do have um, over, sometimes in many cases, 200 years of, of knowledge and understanding about the forestry industry. We have families that have been in Hearst for over 300, 200 years that have been involved in forestry for all of those times and let's try to, and we have First Nations communities that have been on the land base for thousands and thousands of years. Let's, let's exploit that knowledge and, and, and that connection and let's see what we can build together. And uh, I'm not gonna go over that, but that's just to show you that we are planning strategically. We're not just throwing ideas in the air. <laughs> we actually have models of how we wanna do it. Um, and I, I'm bringing this forward because uh, when you're talking about what we're gonna build together, what we wanna do, um, you have to consider thinking differently. Um, and, and I know it's something that we sometimes have a very hard time to do with in, in society and as human beings. But insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So if, as an economic development officer, or as an economic development corporation, you do the same thing for 50 years and you get upset that you're not getting different results, maybe you need to give your head a shake. And I think in Northern Ontario, um, you know, no matter how uh, savvy we may think we are, we really need to a real reality check and we really need to give ourselves a shake, if not every day, because if you start taking things for granted and thinking you're on the right path, you might be getting too, uh, too used to what you're doing and thinking that you are and without really thinking and being critical about what you're trying to do and what your approach is. Um, so self-criticism sometimes and constructive, not, not, not the negative type, <laughs> is very, very, very important as a community and as an individual always thinking back and trying to think and how we can do things more efficiently. Um, and of course, in everything that we do, there's always going to be these huge um, obstacles, or we think they're huge obstacles. For Northern Ontario, transportation and infrastructure are huge ones, especially when you're talking about the Energy Act and you're talking about diversification of the forestry sector. Uh, if you can't actually get any product on the rail line because the rail line will not accept product directly. You have to ship it to Montreal, then from Toronto, and then reship it back. And then there's just all these processes around transportation that limit uh, capacity to get a new product, value-added product or not, uh, to the market. And transportation is a huge one. Infrastructure. 
Um, you know, Hearst has been working on a biomass uh, cogent for well, many years. There's heritage piles, 27 years worth of, um, of potential for energy production that we can't access because there's no room on the grid line um, because there's a bottleneck somewhere. So here you have a project where the money is 51% local ownership. Community members have been money in the project. They can't get through with a PG and OPA because there's no line capacity. But then you see dams and, and, and solar panel parks going up. And so we're happy that there's other types of development. Um, how, what's, what's the community, what's going to be the impact on the community if it's something that stands alone and that can be operated digitally in Germany? <laughs> So it's one of those thoughts. And hyper-individualism is a huge one. I don't think we realize how much we've created barriers between each other. Um, I think it was, thinking back, Margaret Thatcher in 1978 that said, there is no such, such thing as society. There are just individuals and their families, and that there is no alternative to that model. Um, hyper-individualism is a huge issue. People are not connecting to each other. If you look at uh, architecture and modern architecture, um, you know, family rooms in many American homes, North American homes, are non-existent. It's like they're trying to create so much individualism within even a family unit. And so we really have to start thinking about what we do on a personal level and how we connect to each other on a personal level uh, before we can even start thinking about what we're going to accomplish as a community or society. And so relationships, very important. <laughs> and then just the last little plug, uh, one of the ways that we're hoping to accomplish all these big ambitious uh, dreams and strategies is through our Green Business and Technology Center, um, which is obviously, uh, it's, it's this big project. We've built it all with local wood. It's completely off the grid. It has um, a 10 kilowatt uh, microfit system with the Green Energy Act, yay. <laughs> it actually brings in revenue to the center, which is pretty awesome. We've got solar heating tubes, so we have geothermal, we have biomass. We've used every single green technology that we could potentially utilize in our center so that it's actually tangible and people can touch it and feel it and understand how it works and how it can be applied in their business or in their home. And uh, it's also about community development. It's about building that capacity, making the links and partnerships between universities, colleges, high schools, um, we're going to have the first provincial program in green and energy and technology in Ontario. It's going to be offered through our high school, through our green technology center, in her school of funk. <laughs> and uh, it will have a bioscience lab laboratory, business incubator training in, um, in renewable learning. And obviously, so that we're not big hypocrites, <laughs> the center was built with obviously local wood and uh, green technologies and utilizing uh, local capacities and, and local expertise rather than importing uh, things that we could already do locally from welding to, uh, to building the trusses and everything else. And so that's what it looks like and it's almost done and I'm going to be able to move into my office. I'm very excited about it. <laughs> and here are the last um, thoughts. If, if you were to ask me about um, how do we move forward and how do we build community resiliency? Firstly, it would be about checking your ambitions and what you think can be accomplished because there are no miracle solutions. It's not going to be one thing that's going to save us. There is no uh, one solution. I don't really believe in absolute solutions whatsoever. It's going to be a combination of a lot of things. Um, it's going to be about working together. If you can't work together and you're that kind of individual person is saying, that's my vision, it's the way I'm going to do it, um, it's really not going to work. <laughs> and you have to work through community and not in isolation from the things that matter and make life worthwhile. If you're in economic development and you think that it's all about economy, get out of the business. <laughs> you have no understanding of what actually makes an economy work and what makes a community work. Uh, and things don't always make, uh, things make more sense when you, you touch it back to what is gonna make life meaningful and what's gonna give quality of life to your citizens and what's gonna make businesses and people want to move to your community and develop innovative and strong businesses. And mostly, and this is my biggest pet peeve, and I'm really, really sorry about it, but stop calling it green economy. Um, <laughs> and I will explain myself. Um, and the biggest example I'm going to use is the organic movement. Uh, organic agriculture farmers, small-scale farmers, worked so hard to develop that market to the point where it got the attention of the general mills and the Conagros and the Cargills. And it was re and the profit margins and, and uh, the, the inflation of the business was going up 20% on a yearly basis. In 2006, the largest producers of organic produce were Cargill. They were not just produce, also Cargill does mostly chicken, chicken but uh, Conagra and General Mills. These are industrial, multinational businesses. These aren't your local farmers. And so that's why the movement 
that was initially about organic is now moving to slow food and local because they're utilizing terms that actually mean something. And green can be easily co-opted. I've had, I've received pamphlets from mining companies, from hydro dams that are so pretty and the package is compostable. I could probably, you know, they have seeds in them and I could plant it. And, and, <laughs> and it's frustrating because if you really want to build something in Northern Ontario and you want community resiliency, you have to start talking about people economies, integrated economies, and deep economies. And, and green is great, but it's not the end all, end all. So that's my spiel. <laughs> Wow, thanks so much, Dinesh. Um, I don't think we have that much time, but like maybe if there's one question for Dinesh, because we need to move on before we get to the next panel. Yeah, Julie. Dinesh, um, with the, that presentation was great, by the way. <laughs> but um, so with your community, mostly with Constance Lake and hers being small enough that you do have this really common, like really strong common thread, how do you think something like that might be able to relate to a community like Thunder Bay that's, that's bigger, more diverse, like how it's kind of multiple communities together? How, like what do you think the key principles are for trying to bring people together here? I think it's about developing a culture and focusing on those things that, that, that can bridge people together the way that Jude was talking about it. And I think it would be wrong to say that Hearst is this, Hearst and Constance Lake are like this beautiful cohesive package of people that are related to each other because we have our fair share of people who don't get along. We have our fair share of individuals who just will not connect or talk to each other and we face the same challenges in terms of having a very diverse crowd and individuals who might not like the idea of a sustainable development plan and we have a lot of them uh, and we have to work equally with all of those members and I think it's ensuring that you're not I guess for me it's it's utilizing an approach that is not exclusive um, you know I, I look at the crowd today and you have you're surrounded by I, what I believe is, is a crowd of like-minded individuals who have very similar um, interests. If you can't have uh, these types of forums that bring together a diverse crowd and get people to talk about things uh, in, in, a, in a meaningful way to each other, even though they don't ideologically might not jive together, uh, it's not going to work. And you can do that on, on, on a large scale as much as you can do it on a small scale. And, it, and I think it's about finding those issues and those things that matter to everybody. And uh, you know, and I think the best examples sometimes are, are education or healthcare. Everybody's got a parent, everybody has, or almost everyone, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to exclude those that might not have children or grandparents, but there are things that bring people commonly together and you just have to hold on to those things and, 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 and utilize it as a topic of discussion. And so if it's, it's, if it's about having a job or healthy communities and those sorts of things, and, and unfortunately, it's not, I'm not trying to be critical because I'm extremely excited about the forum that was, excited, uh, that was organized, and I think it's great. Um, but by having titles like Green Economy, you're going to be attracting a very specific crowd. And so you have to make an, ex, an explicit, uh, I mean, you have to make a, a greater effort to ensure that you have something that's going to be able to draw a more diverse crowd rather than something that is very focused on, on one perspective. Great, thanks so much Dinesh for those thoughts. So um, we'll move on and our next speaker is Dr. Michel Bolio. He is the director of the Center for Northern Studies and associate professor of history at Lakehead University. Um, in 2001, Michelle received uh, an honors BA in history and English and a bachelor of education, I guess simultaneously from Lakehead, um, and then uh, did a history, uh, a master's of history focusing on early Northwestern Ontario films in, in 2003. Then he did a PhD specializing in Northern Ontario labor history, uh, and that was at Queen's University in 2008. A self-described community-based historian, um, Dr. Bolio believes that the result of the research that historians perform should be accessible to everyone, especially those whose story he's trying to tell. As a result, he participates in a multitude of community organizations. He's chair of the Bay Street International Film Festival and sits on several boards, including Thunder Bay Historical Museum Society, the Canadian International Council, and the Northwestern Ontario Archivists Association. Michelle was born and raised in Brampton, Ontario, but said that he chooses to live in Thunder Bay because of his strong belief in the potential of the North, a belief in its power.
class and its future. So welcome to Chapman. This, oh, okay, there we go. I love the internet. Uh, at least you got that one, that rather than another one you probably could have found at some point. Um, and it's interesting, because the last presentation, uh, and this was not planned in any form or fashion, actually ties into what I'm going to talk about, which is a little bit different. Uh, and um, the nice thing about new technology is that I'm able to switch exactly what I was going to say to something when I walked into the room earlier, I wasn't going to talk about. Uh, what I am going to talk about, though, is I'm going to touch upon the idea of rethinking sustainable development. Uh, and this is not something that's providing answers. Uh, this is not something that's actually a finished product. But it's something that a number of us have been working with for quite some time. Uh, to give you a bit of a frame of reference before I launch into it, um, is that uh, the idea, I mean, it made me laugh with the slides being in French, because I think it's one of these things where, well, French, uh, other languages, and other cultures, so much of the discussion is about not actually engaging not only regional community, but international community. Uh, and that a lot of the tools that uh, what I'm going to talk about that I think you need to bring to bear on talking about sustainable development, communities, the green economy, uh, is going beyond our comfort zone. Um, it's amazing as a, a, a northern historian specialist, but also someone who does forest and mining development history, uh, that um, half the knowledge in any given year, in any given class, is not being read because it's in Francais or it's in, it's in English. It's a very interesting divide that occurs with, even in northern Ontario. Uh, now, what I'm going to touch upon and hit upon involves um, work that's been ongoing with a number of us. Uh, I'm actually here with myself as well as a colleague who's sort of there, I guess, um, Ronald Harpel, who is a Latin Americanist. Uh, because the approach that we've been taking in looking at sustainable development uh, is one that's actually incorporating the idea that the North is the New South. Um, what I'm going to be drawing upon, although not making specific examples, is work looking at three uh, Finnish communities, largely forest communities, um, two Uruguayan communities from South America, uh, five Northern Ontario communities, uh, including Erst, actually, um, as well as uh, drawing upon stuff dealing with Costa Rica, Panama, uh, as well as other towns such as uh, Dugreville. Um, so, with just getting an idea of how we should rethink, uh, how we should look at the idea of globalization, and also in its relationship to the concept of time and space. Now, I'm going to begin, because I'm a historian, so I'm going to begin a little bit further back, but a report prepared in 1922 on the conditions of prospects of banana plantations in Panama stated, a banana plantation is a lousy place to live, unless, of course, you're a banana. That's my attempt at humor this morning. <laughs> a review of various media sources and general opinion amongst Canadians living in large urban areas is that, in particular, forest communities in the north are lousy places to live unless you're one of the remaining trees that happens to be in the region and you tend to be a corporation that wants to take that tree out. Canada is, as much as we want to argue, an urban country that is always dependent upon its natural resources, but it's an urban-based country. That's not going to change. Now, as a result of the significant decline in the demand for forest products in some areas of the world, although if you're uh, a toilet paper manufacturer, uh, you're doing quite well right now, uh, the forest industry communities across Canada have suffered rapid declines, all well aware of this, uh, well-being as well, uh, as a result of massive layoffs. And this is the other thing, is I'm not an economist, I'm actually uh, a student of history, but I look at things in a more most, uh, holistic way. I mean, yes, you know, declines in forestry, yes, declines, I'm more interested in the jobs that are lost and what it does for community well-being, and how those communities can actually adapt and change. Now, life is complex, um, and uh, not more complex, but it's a different complex in northern remote communities, that often I think individuals, in particular academics, who are looking at these communities don't realize. But there are no less lousy places to live than anywhere else in the world, despite what local media would like to think. It's all about um, context, it's all about what you're used to. If you have the means to support yourself and your family, these are some of the best places to live, as far as I'm concerned. But this gets lost in a lot of the analysis, especially straight economic analysis. But in order for communities to survive, the residents have to be able to see beyond the horizon to be able to build a sustainable economic future. We're not to, it's not, so I'm not saying that it hasn't been done. What I'm arguing, what I think, is that that horizon and where, you're, where people are looking has to go much more broader, has to go much more global. Now, former Prime Minister of Canada, Mackenzie King, provides a context by which the work we've been doing is. And he observed in 1936 to a speech to the House of Commons that if some countries have too much history, we have too much geography. And this aptly, I think, applies to North, Northern Ontario, where you're all familiar with these statistics. Borrow forests cover over 40 million hectares, or 400,000 square kilometers. It's part of the largest ecosystem on the planet. 
Industrial development in our region began in the 19th century and expanded westward. Northern Ontario's role expanded from merely a staging point to development to, to a, a central cog in what becomes the development of central uh, Canada. Our region remains scarcely populated until government programs to stimulate enterprise, welcome private entrepreneurs, and attracted homesteaders who were introduced in the late 1800s. Uh, I'm not excluding the Aboriginal population, I'm talking about industrial development here, so this is by the presentation talk more about Aboriginal development. So, um, The forest industry plays, I think we all agree, an essential role in sustaining environments and communities, including the 28 First Nations we have within our region. Canada ranks third behind Russia and Brazil in terms of forest cover and boreal forest, which covers most of the northern part of the subarctic uh, part of the country, as well as much of northern and circumpolar world. I mean, I can throw out some stats about uh, how much uh, paper contributes. Uh, paper products, for example, contribute 58 billion per year to Canada. It's the world's largest, uh, and we're one of the world's largest exporter of these products. Um, I can also throw out, in terms of job losses, over 10, estimated over 10,000 in the region, um, and you know, uh, 225 mills have closed in recent memory. Now, the forest industry remains an important part of Ontario, over 80,000 people work within it, sales over 19 billion a year, uh, exports exceed 8.7 billion. Um, but one of the things that I, I find in the work that I do is that it, it's still not grabbing the attention. Um, and when it does, it's in a way that it seems to be out of jive with what's going on internationally. With notions of sustainable development practices, Ontario's share of the global forest industry should remain significant. I mean, I'm not one of these individuals, and I think the work we've been doing shows is that we're still going to remain an important um, element, particularly with sustainable practices. However, and the big thing is that the concept of sustainable development brought to the world, many of you might know, in 1987 by Norwegian Prime Minister, uh, Gro Harlem Rundland, um, who at the time was the chair of the Commission on Environment and Development, has been slow in coming and being applied to Canada and in terms of the dialogue. One reason for this delay is that Rundland's concept of sustainable development has been seen until recently as a model for the non-industrialized world, essentially the developing countries or what we call the Global South. His notion of balance between environmental protection and the social and economic needs of humans, in which he defines as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs, has become, uh, we, uh, I would argue, more important to Canada in direct correlation between job losses in the forest industry as well as unsustainable methods in terms of both resource exploitation as well as in how we actually conceive of our communities. We tend to be locked in models of what we perceive as a community, how a community should develop, how a community should structure, even how a community should finance itself. That we, have, we need to look beyond um, what we're used to in our comfort zone. Now, with recent continuing change in attitude among citizens and governments, corporations reacting on, a, uh, on an as-need basis New possibilities for sustain, uh, sustaining the health and viability of communities are possible. But residents of these communities need to develop a better understanding of what globalization is, so they can better adapt to the changes that this new economic paradigm brings with it. I mean, globalization is a term that um, you pick up, you go to the internet, you search it, you're going to find hundreds of different definitions. I mean, we've sort of settled on a version of what globalization means. Often that is focused on the notion of multi multinational corporations, often it's the evil of multinational corporations, I'm not saying that they're friendly, um, but what I'm saying is we tend to get hooked on these certain ideas. Now, keeping in mind the Brentland's conception of sustainable development, one of the things we're finding is that when exploring northern resource development in basically this new economic paradigm, whatever you want to call it, um, it's important to draw upon different fields. I mean, we can learn from uh, studies and work done in Latin America we can learn from Central American banana plantations. We can also learn from the growing body of literature in international development. I mean, Canada is a leading expert in international development through agencies such as the uh, IDRC. I mean, we are uh, putting in place uh, systems, um, methods of dealing with uh, change in other parts of the world by educating um, through uh, government funding researchers in those, in, in those countries. A lot of those principles and practices, though, aren't actually backward linkaging. Uh, to, to basically what we're doing within Canada in terms of domestic sphere. Northern communities, like banana plantations, are single industry towns, and they're confronted with what are essentially the same challenges of developing a remote community in Africa or Asia. There is a whole host of similarities that we tend to not look at. Part of this is tied to um, our mentality, uh, being a you know, northern, uh, western-based uh, civilization, I guess. 
where we tend to, through historically, and even today, tend to actually look down or be suspect of different changes of uh, dealing with development and dealing with economic change that's done in non-Western parts of the world. Now, some of these are difficult to, uh, uh, to assess because of different economic structures, different pasts, different contemporary problems, but they do focus upon issues of health, education, the ability for individuals to actually live within their communities. They also deal with very similar trends. The best and brightest of many of these communities throughout the world tend to go to centers such as Toronto, New York, Paris, Delhi, Beijing, Montevideo, Uruguay, where opportunities are said to exist. That's a key thing, said to exist. It becomes a process by which we're trained that if you want to have opportunity, you want to have success, uh, 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 successful stability economically in terms of employment as well, it exists there. I mean, it assumes that there's a vacuum and currently where people are or the potential isn't there. I mean, it might seem a small thing that I'm remincing words, but it is something that people do as you're going through education systems as well as other things. You do tend to learn, which does impact your decisions later on. Northern resource-based communities are also, like many places throughout the world, company-based towns, both historically as well as today, where corporations have much more sway than governments. I mean, I'm sorry, we can uh, put nice, uh, I guess I said this to my students. We put little smiley faces on things, you know, attach little uh, slogans about individuals helping community development, but they're company-based towns, often based upon the idea of what the company's there for, which is profit. I mean, they can build into models that will help sustain that, uh, that, that community, but once the product is gone, their obligation is gone with it. Such communities are also characterized by the stress, and it is stress, both stress in terms of economically, but stress upon families and livelihood, that export markets, management of the industry that can be alien to the way of life that most of us actually naturally want to be living or trying to live. I mean, the, 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 you know, the uh, phrase often being, well, it's just business. Fine, that may be true, but on the other hand, it does add undue stresses. And industrial relations that are often more suited to the shop floor in one of Henry Ford's plants than to interrelated rural communities. I mean, despite the literature, growing literature on the subject, despite how we're trying to re-envision communities and make them sustainable, we still tend to get locked into uh, a very old, and as far as I'm concerned, antiquated model of industrial relations. It's a shop floor model that becomes adapted to rural lifestyle, rather than possibly looking at rural lifestyle adapting the shop floor model. I mean, that seems alien to a lot of individuals. There's a lot of complexities involved in it, but it is trying to reconceive and break out of a mold. Now, to demonstrate this, I want to hit upon two worldviews. I think this can understand in some small way something of how remote communities are hindered by the forces of globalization and how we actually have, I think, a, with a new technology, with the internet, with growing, uh, I mean, really the, the cheap feasibility of travel, um, research being in some cases less expensive to do internationally, how talking to other parts of the world can actually help us not provide necessarily get answers, but begin dialogues that can lead to shared answers. Because the, the issues facing um, the workers in the brand new Pulpo and Freventos in Uruguay are the same issues and the same concerns as those facing those individuals who live as Terrace Bay, First, Atacocan, Fort Francis, Cochrane, you name it. Having the dialogue with workers. I mean, I was there in December uh, for almost a month and I met with individuals in the Labour Council. Um, they're trying to organize a union, you know, within, in the terms of the forced workers within land. They're trying to organize one and, and dealing with a multinational corporation. I mean, it, it's, it's alien to them in terms of how basically uh, largely agricultural ranching-based uh, workers are now dealing with the complexities of a multinational corporation that ships uh, pulp to China as well as Germany. I mean, it's the it same, same experiences, uh, differences with all the regional context, but it is a dialogue that needs to occur because in my sense, they're all, we're all workers, we're all people, we're all human beings, and it's that shared where we can actually, if it's just not regional but more international, more global, it'll create a stronger, stable base for all communities throughout the world to actually survive um, and exist. Now, several years ago, um, one of the others, uh, in this case, Ron, um, encountered a man whose entire world was approximately 100 kilometers long by no more than a few kilometers wide. A liberal estimation is that his world was 500 square kilometers in overall size. He lived on a plane along a highway that ran along the Pacific coast of Costa Rica. He had never ventured more than 40 or 50 kilometers in either of the two directions that the road ran and the roads towards the interior were blocked by mountains. The man worked on a plantation where housing was provided by the owner to married employees as part of a salary. He was approximately 30 years old when encountered, and he related that he could not understand what a foreigner was doing in his hometown of Barita. 
He had never been to San Jose, the capital city, or much beyond a few neighboring communities. The reason for this was that he did not know anything about the outside world, and did not know what he would do if he went somewhere else, and did not have family or friends to visit with. As he commented, what would be the point of going anywhere if you don't know anything about the people there? This brief encounter with a young plantation work, uh, laborer in a poor country, or poorer country, may not seem surprisingly given that poverty can limit mobility. Both, author, both of us, have had, uh, myself and Ron, have had similar encounters with a young man recently who'd been laid off from a lumber mill in the company town of Dubreville. Located 40 kilometers inland from the Trans-Canada Highway in northern Ontario, this man um, had uh, very little education. Um, he had definitely no more education than the Costa Rican laborer that uh, we had, um, he had encountered. The man from Northern Ontario had traveled a little, a little further up, down the, uh, up and down the highway that connected his community to nearby ones like Wawa. Unlike the first man, he had once been to Ottawa, the nation's capital, but he did not like it because it was too big. Two years after moving to the bustling city of Thunder Bay, where he hoped to offer his children a new life with new possibilities, he packed up and headed back to Dubreville for what he considered a healthier environment. Now, he, could just, he just could not provide in many cases for his family, and they were obliged to live when he was in Thunder Bay in what was considered an economically depressed and somewhat uh, troubled neighborhood, because that's all they could afford. He had attempted to expand his world, but failed at adjusting to what some people would consider modern life, but what I would actually consider a different way of life. In many ways, these two men are the personification of how um, the group that we've been working with in the four different countries, um, how resource-dependent communities face when looking out at the world. The forces that shape their lives are far beyond their reach, and change, or something different, can be feared because it means taking a step into the unknown, and more importantly, the tools aren't provided for the knowledge of the unknown. These two working class lives, though separated by six international boundaries, over 5,000 kilometers, and about 30 years, also illustrate an aspect of globalization that is not yet to be fully understood. How do individuals, to tie into what was recently said, caught in the cross currents of global economic forces, understand their situation and how they uh, can, and how they uh, adjust, uh, sorry, understand their situation and how to they can adjust or can be adjust to boundaries of their small world, the realities of millions of square kilometers in size with a population of six billion people, most of whom are now concentrated in cities of immense proportions. Now, one way, I'm sorry, skipping ahead, is that is basically looking at how we actually view this notion of time and space and the, con and the compression of it. Um, the compression of time and space is a result of technologies that serve to reduce spatial and temporal distances connecting people and markets in innovative ways. I mean, it's interesting. Companies have figured this out. I mean, forestry uh, always has been a global industry, and is even more so. Um, I mean, the company that owns the, uh, uh, the mill in uh, Prebentos, um, UBM, uh, is a massive multinational forestry company. I mean, the mill in South America is one of the most modern mills on the planet. I mean, it produces, um, this single mill produces more uh, pulp than the average four mills that we actually have in Northern Ontario. It ships at half the cost that it takes us to ship it domestically. Think about this, pulp's produced, South America, here's the tip, it's half the cost to ship it to China or Germany for, uh, for, um, for the pulp made into paper than our most efficient mills can do. That's, and I mean, I'm not going to get into a debate about technological change or the need for it or whatever. It's a reality. I mean, it's one thing to argue about uh, fiber quality. It's one thing to argue about the need to retool mills. I mean, all this, I think, is very important. But this is a current reality that's going on right now that needs to be discussed and needs to have a much more wider discussion in terms of how communities in northern Ontario are actually adapting to their changing circumstances. It doesn't matter what we do, UPM will still run that mill. There's another mill, even bigger, being built just up the way waterway in the same country. So I mean, so this is a reality that's being faced in terms of corporations have compressed time and space. Time is irrelevant, or space is irrelevant, and often time isn't. You can be beamed from the headquarters in, in Finland to that mill, and something can be discussed instantaneously. It's not translating necessarily to how communities are mobilizing, and how individuals are actually conceive of, uh, conceiving of the world. Now, one, the, the compression um, has resulted uh, in, this, uh, in the opening of markets, the redistribution of modern industry to all parts of the world. 
I mean, my argument uh, and the argument we've been making in terms of what communities are facing is not just a dialogue that has to occur between inter-Canadian um, provincial discussions. It's definitely not a discussion that's just uh, connected to, as we seem to fixate on softwood lumber and connections with the United States. Again, it's important. It has to be discussed. But the issues that are facing communities within the North go much beyond that. And to become fixated on that one element of a global industry, actually you, you leave off the other important discussions, which I would argue have much longer term ramifications. Because the mills and other uh, forest developments in other parts of the world, in particular South America, I'm using the Argentina example, but now you have Uruguay involved, you have Brazil, you have growing demand in terms of China. I mean, the that's where things are might be occurring. From Nokia plants in Chennai, India, to the factories of China, the pulpits of Latin America, industry has taken advantage of improved communication and information systems to reduce the barriers of time and space that protected industry in North America and Europe from global competition. I mean, this is one of those things where we're at a, a bubble. I mean, we were protected. Now we're not in many different ways. Now, and I'll sort of end with this because I know we're running out of time. One of the ways in which we're conceiving of and playing with is rethinking the framework when we're looking at the industrial past to, uh, to uh, inform the industrial future. Now, we used to look at the discussion of economic growth centered on an urban-rural divide. And most of you are probably familiar with this. We talk about urban, urban situations, rural situations, compare, contrast. We often talk about things about metropoles um, and, and periphery areas. The idea was the modern world ended at the outskirts of a city and that growth resulted from the city's expansion outwards. It's a pretty familiar model. New centers would pop up from time to time, but dynamism was always located in the metropole. Now, the dependency, the dependency theorists of the 1960s exploited these notions to explain why there could never be any significant economic advancement in the periphery. Northern Ontario, under this model, is considered a periphery. Today's emerging economies in China, India, and Brazil, or countries, are a challenge to dependency theorists but the jury is still out because of the enormous disparities in wealth within these communities and the fragile nature of some of the, quote, development that has taken place. Sao Paulo, for example, is second only to New York in terms of the number of private helicopters. However, it has one of the largest populations of street children on the planet and about 25% of the world's poorest citizens live in India, which is about 15% of the world's population. Growth is evident in these economies, but the dynamics of change are different than in the past. Now, one model that helps to understand, and I mean, and this is sort of a, it's a knowledge transfer, knowledge sharing type of thing, where to understand how the, the, how the world is changing in terms of this aspect of globalization, it's also important to understand how economies in these other regions are actually being shaped themselves. One model is something called the Descota Zone. Um, now, the Descota Zone uh, is based upon an Indonesian term meaning villager town and it refers to an extended metropolitan region. In Indonesia, these are regions linked to major urban centers by cheap transport accesses, where more intensive exploitation of land, labor, and other resources can take place than in purely rural areas. I mean, the term actually refers to closely interlinked, co-penetrating, urban-rural livelihoods, communication, transportation, and economic systems. Now, this idea originally focused on non-industrialized countries, where the gap between rural and urban is a gap between centuries of economic development, the legacy of colonialism, other types of things related to that. But it also can be applied to remote regions of northwestern Ontario, where the effects of globalization comes from rapid space-time collapse. I mean, the, the world opening up creates, uh, as I've mentioned already, new situations that are occurring at a very rapid rate. The world has intensified the movement of goods, people, information, and finance between sites of consumption and production. And as a consequence of this, the push and pull factors that are altering the economies of northern, uh, northern communities, and not just in Ontario but elsewhere, are much more global. I mean, it's a nature trying to understand that relationship. I mean, it's no longer a, situ a decision being based as much, uh, much of history talks about in terms of Toronto or Ottawa. The decisions that are actually impacting deal with extra, uh, well, issues, uh, countries and decisions we can't, deal, we can't actually legislate. We also can't actually put sanctions on necessarily. The idea that northern communities are now much closer to manufacturing centers of southern Ontario is something we're quite used to, but we're also just as easily much more closer to manufacturing centers across the planet, or will be, depending upon how we change. Now, as time and space becomes less and less a factor in decision making, 
it can become easier to imagine a different kind of economy that can be competitive to global markets. One of the constraints faced by northern communities, and one of the things that we're finding in, and this is based upon a series of interviews, over 100 interviews in all these different communities, um, is their adapt ability to adapt to change. Uh, and the laws that govern exploitation of natural resources, and all those aspects that depend upon their lives for survival. Canada has always been dependent on its natural resource industries and the export of forest and mining commodities, um, and I don't think this is going to change. And the de this dependency, though, has a consequence. I mean, it served to undermine other aspects of regional economies that can be developed. Uh, and it also, in, in this case, requires a change in terms of what that diversification of the economy can be. I mean, and there's no answer to this, and I don't have an answer, so no one asked me, but I mean, there is that level of looking at what type of, people are asking questions. I mean, this was uh, throughout our entire surveys. I'm sort of condensing things, that's why it might seem disjointed right now. I mean, one of the common questions asked in both Canada, Uruguay, Finland, some stuff that was done in uh, places like Costa Rica, was that where in the world do we go from here? The solutions were often envisioned upon pre-existing notions of how the economy worked, their relationships often to their metropoles. So if we want to find out how to change our economy or how to make our community sustainable, we're only going to be having discussions with the capital in that area. Or we're only going to be having discussions with a specific area surrounding it. One of the things that we have been finding in terms of looking at how corporate models have been looking at things, as well as taking an idea about the Descota Zone um, notion, is that time and space can be compressed in this. That these discussions can go actually much broader than that. And when they go much broader, the first thing that, that's encountered is that individuals in different parts of the world are having the exact same discussion as individuals and communities here are having. And how they're adapting to these changes well, might not be models that can be actually transplanted and put into northern communities, are in many ways very different. They're unique. They're also lessons that can be learned. I mean, and I'll sort of end with this. One of the other things that we uh, found uh, is that there's often was a notion that what was occurring, uh, there's a sense of loss of our own history, that this idea and the cycles that have occurred in terms of bust and boom, as much as we're aware of them, we always keep thinking that the current bust is in many ways the, the most uh, cataclysmic crisis we faced. So there's our own element of history that we sometimes actually forget in terms of how we've adapted to it. There's also this interesting conceit we have in the northern part of the world that no other part of the world has actually gone through anything similar. I mean, one of the things that other parts of the world have gone through is that, I mean, and one of the arguments um, that uh, I would make is that we're experiencing something that Africa, Latin America, and Asia have gone through a long time ago, a process of decolonization. I mean, no, Ontario, I mean, used to be called New Ontario. It's colonized. I mean, you talk to Aboriginal peoples and First Nations, and they'll more than happy to tell you about colonization. But our communities have also been colonized. I mean, our towns are a product of a, a system that has been looked at and discussed to death of, col of, col uh, of colonization, you can say the word. The process of decolonization, though, and a decolonization, how it relates to communities, their survival, their sustainability, there's lots of lessons to be learned from basically the other 5.6 billion people on the planet. Again, it might not be a fit, and I, there's no answers necessarily, but it's a dialogue that needs to occur. So I'll leave with that. I do apologize for it being slightly disjointed. I was sort of condensing something that was a much larger presentation. Uh, but yeah, so thank you. Merci. Thank you so much, uh, Michelle. That was that was great. I don't know if we have time for questions, Peter. Do we have to move on? Uh, it would be great if we do, but I know it is almost eleven, right? We're, we've started a bit late. <laughs> uh, for a little bit. I've got another meeting, so. Well, we have uh, you know five ten minutes right now. If you want to talk with uh, Michelle on your own, and uh, I, mean, I guess let's stick around for for a small amount of time. Um, but we need to set up uh, the table here for the candidates, so uh, if you want to grab a coffee or something.